Why don't we proceed? Jim, are you We've doing got a good? Quorum here. The uh, Rules Committee will come to order. We are here for the consideration of the Department of Defense Appropriations uh, Bill. Uh, I will say that we uh, were at this point going to uh, consider two measures dealing with Libya. We're not going to consider those uh, this afternoon. And uh, following consideration of uh, what I hope will, uh, I hope this committee will grant an open rule for the Department of Defense Appropriations Bill. We're going to uh, deal um, with uh, the survey of activities and we're going to uh, formalize our subcommittees here in the Rules Committee. So let me say that it's a great pleasure to have the distinguished chair and our very, very uh, good friend Bill Young, the leader of the Defense Appropriations Subcommittee, as I said, and uh, our equally good friend who uh, the only thing that uh, I thought when Steny Hoyer said we all congratulated him on having cast, uh, what, 400,000 votes? 220,000. Oh, okay. yeah, I, I <laughs> thought it was set the record straight. No, I thought Sarah said 400,000 votes uh, in the House. Uh, when, he said chair, when he said chairman in waiting, if that's how he wants to refer to the ranking member, he's welcome to do that. But we're happy to have you both. And gentlemen, let me say uh, again at the outset, as you know, we have been uh, allowing for uh, an open amendment process on, uh, on appropriations bills, uh, it's created challenges. And uh, when we look at our, our goal of trying to um, keep to somewhat of a schedule, to be done by 7 o'clock tonight, that's going to extend just a, a little bit by an hour, to meet our uh, times uh, for adjournment for the week. Uh, it hasn't been easy, but um, the ability to propound unanimous consent agreements on the floor when it comes to appropriations <clears throat> bills is something that we very much, from this committee and from the management responsibility that we have, want to encourage. Uh, we know there have been some difficulties with that, but um, this bill, I, I was recounting, I should say, uh, that this bill in the past, I think, has been considered and voted on in three and a half minutes on the House floor before under an open amendment process. Um, I suspect it'll take a little longer than that uh, this year, but we very much look forward to, uh, I know, a free-flowing debate and uh, what I hope will be an open amendment process. So. We're happy to recognize the distinguished chair of the subcommittee, Mr. Young. Well, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. It is always a pleasure and a privilege to appear before the distinguished members of the House Committee on Rules. And thank you for listening to our statements. I have a very lengthy statement that I would prefer to put in the record and just uh, make a brief summary. As you suggested, we will ask for an open rule as we have always done on a defense bill. We've always asked for an open rule, and we believe that the membership has, has the right to be involved in the preparation of the final bill. Uh, we would prefer that you do not uh, protect any non-germane amendments uh, that would uh, not, basically not relate to the bill. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Let me divide the bill into two sections. The base bill with the basic operations for the Department of Defense is $530 billion. Uh, it is $9 billion less than requested by the President, but that was our 302B allocation, and as you know, 302B allocations, uh, you stick by them. And of course, as appropriators, we also have an additional problem that other committees don't have. We have to deal with outlays not only appropriated funds, but we have to make sure that the outlays um, match uh, our uh, budgetary authority. But the $530 billion is the basic bill. There's also $119 billion that we refer to as the OCOA, or the Overseas Contingency Operation, uh, which is basically Iraq and Afghanistan. And that is pretty much what the, uh, what the President requested. In order to reduce the, from 539 billion to 530, we had to find a lot of savings. But I will tell you that we did not have an, any adverse effect on the warfighter. We did not create any adverse effect on medical care for the warfighter. We did not have any adverse effect on readiness of the nation. But we did pick up some funds that weren't being used, some contracts that uh, were basically stalemated. 
uh, some contracts that we had, we got a better deal than we thought we were going to get, and we were able to pick up that money without having an adverse effect on the warfighter uh, or on the, uh, uh, on the readiness of the, of the nation. There's a lot of details uh, in the bill, and we have provided written, written copies on, on numerous occasions uh, to all of the membership, and I'd be very happy to uh, read this whole thing, but I won't because it, it contains $530 billion worth of spending. And put that in the, put, have that in your record. Uh, we are uh, built uh, joint strike fighters. We provided for 32 joint strike fighters, which is, of course, important that we can guarantee that, that any troop that is fighting uh, on our side have be protected by aviation assets that are ours, uh, over the battlefield. Uh, we provide for 10 LCS ships. And there and again, we would like to have seen more. We would like to have seen more uh, Joint Strike fighters, but we just could not do it with our 302B allocation. We did provide sufficient funding for the 1.6% pay raise for our military. And there again, we would have, would have, we would have really liked to have done a lot more for them because we think they deserve a lot more uh, considering uh, what they're dealing with and what they have to face up, uh, face every day, especially those that are deployed. But the, uh, the, the funding for the pay raise is included. Uh, there are a lot, of other, uh, a lot of other issues if you want to question about other than that, I just, I would, I, I would reserve my time and uh, turn to Mr. Dix who is, uh, who was chairman last year but unfortunately, he didn't get to bring his bill to the committee. Uh, he deserved it because it was a good bill. He deserved a chance to go through the process, but it, it just didn't happen. Uh, but it did happen finally uh, as H.R. 1 uh, this year, and H.R. 1 was basically the bill that, mm -hmm. that Mr. Dix chaired uh, and working in total cooperation with, uh, with me as we have totally co cooperated with him as we prepared the FY12 bill. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Young. And now I'm happy to uh, recognize the uh, long-suffering, <laughs> but certainly a recovering 20,000 or 30,000 or 40,000 voter, Mr. Dix. Thank you, thank you uh, Chairman Dreyer. As always, it has been a pleasure and an honor to work with my friend and chairman, Mr. Bill Young. Uh, FY2012 defense bill, as mentioned, what appropriates Five hundred and thirty billion. Last year we were at uh, five hundred and thirteen billion. But working as we, as Bill described, with the staff, we were able to make reductions last year and this year. I mean, when you have a bill this of magnitude, there are always things that change between the time the budget request is submitted. There are no earmarks in this bill. Uh, I remain concerned, however, about the funding and the bill for Pakistan and ongoing operations in Afghanistan. There is cause to question the reliability of our partnerships with both countries. In the light of recent events, we must reassess the extent of U.S. military involvement and the objectives of U.S. foreign policy in that part of the world, reexamining whether U.S. national security requires a continued deployment of over 100,000 U.S. service personnel. And the, the President tonight will make a statement on that subject. After a careful review of our security situation, I believe it is time to significantly accelerate the withdrawal of U.S. forces. To accomplish this objective responsibly will take some care. By, by necessity, a political solution in Afghanistan will, will involve negotiations with Taliban representatives and, and possibly Pakistan and even other countries in the region. It will also demand taking into account the interests of surrounding nations to ensure that those neighbors do not fight with one another along sectarian or tribal divides within Afghanistan. Finally, we must guard against creating a vacuum similar to the one that occurred at the end of the Soviet occupation in 1989. Even with these cautions in mind, I believe it is time to begin the process of bringing the level of deployed U.S. troops in line with a new assessment of our security interest in the region. The fact we went there was because of Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda, we have dealt them a devastating blow uh, and uh, over a long period of time. And, uh, and that was the principal reason why we entered this conflict. And I think we've achieved our principal objective. 
Under an open rule, we can pursue the debate on the floor of the House. I support the Chairman's request for an open rule. Thank you very much, Mr. Dix. Thanks again to, uh, to both of you for your hard work. Um, I, there should be no debate on this rule. I mean, I'm, I'm going to encourage the committee to make an order an open rule, which will allow for any germane amendment to uh, be considered. And uh, I think that if you look at the, the work product under the constraints, 302B number that you have, uh, you've done extraordinarily well. And I just uh, congratulate both of you again. Ms. Fox. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have no questions, but I want to thank both of these gentlemen for their good work and uh, appreciated um, the recognition of Mr. Dix today and uh, appreciated uh, seeing him the other night out at the Arboretum. Thank you. It's a wonderful event. Thank you very much. Ms. Slaughter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, I thank you both. Uh, I'm particularly pleased, Mr. Dix, that you brought up the payments to Pakistan, which uh, I think need going over, and I count me among the 72 percent of Americans who think paying $12 billion a month uh, on this adventure has been far too costly, and 46,000 young Americans maimed uh, is an awful burden. So I, I, uh, I appreciate your thoughts about that. And I know that Mr. Young uh, has always been very compassionate and cares very much about the troops, and I appreciate that as well. Thank, Thank you very much. Mr. Bishop. Yeah, let me uh, have an hour with you here, if I could. First of all, I do appreciate um, the efforts you have made on this particular budget. Let's face it, uh, we are to promote general welfare, but we are to provide for the common defense in the Constitution. And if you actually look in Article One, Section 8, I think, what, there's 15 items, six of which we're supposed to do are all related to the military. So this is a key constitutional function that we have. And I think under the constraints, you both have done a brilliant job. This is, a, this is a good bill I want to support there. There are concerns I obviously have. I am concerned about talk about an extra $400 billion in defense cuts to be made. Uh, that, is, that is a high number that have been, has been suggestion, suggested. I hope that with the work you put on this bill that uh, that's not something that's not easily or readily agreed to, that we want to look very carefully at all those particular areas. I do have... And, and one of the problems we have, obviously, with defense is there are so many moving parts in this. Even small decisions have major implications as time goes on. I want you to know, uh, Mr. Young, that I do appreciate your staff on a couple of areas in which we have been talking with you. Uh, one deals specifically with, with some program issues, programming issues. Your staff has been extremely kind in that area to deal with it. There are two concerns I do have that I'd, I'd like to throw at you at this time, which may seem small in the overall view of it, but once again, these, these make a difference. In your budget, you have closed out the, um, um, the, it's a, uh, it's, uh, uh, the precision tracking space system, which is, it's 160 million, which is all which has been zeroed out in this particular budget. Fairness, it was also zeroed out in the authorization bill, but the Senate has kept that full funding in there. I was just wondering if you had privy to a letter that was sent by General Cartwright, who was the acting joint chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff at the time, that talked about the missile defense agencies that maintains their awareness of their threat assessment. They looked at the PTSS system as having initial capabilities that would begin in the 2018 time frame. And actually, the, the bottom line was that the Joint Staff supports PTSS as the most cost-effective future sensor providing assured access and persistent tracking coverage in an integrated ballistic missile defense architecture. And they asked for your continued support of that particular program. I don't know, I just wondering if you had, had, had been aware or had seen the letter from General Cartwright and had responded to it. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we are uh, aware of Mr. Bishop's concern. In fact, we've been working with him and I thank him for complimenting our staff because we do have excellent staff. Uh, and uh, I think we're about to ri arrive at a, uh, at a solution yeah. that would, I think, make, will make you happy. Okay, I, I don't know if you'd, uh, yeah, you will. And you're, I'm gonna be supportive of what you're doing here regardless yeah. of where we end up. And I'm sure we will. I don't know if, if Mr. Dix, you'd had a chance to well, see that particular thing, letter. Well, the only thing I can tell you is that we were following the authorization yeah. committee on this. The authorizers cut this back 
What, what, what number did you say? The, hundred, the total value of it, 160 million. Yeah, they cut it back. So yeah. uh, I think we followed their you did. the leadership of their. You did. The Senate has will have a different version in theirs, but I just I just wondered. I, apparently, you have not had the chance of actually getting the letter or seeing the letter itself. And that I'm sure our staff sense. seen the letter, sure. but I will look. I will I'm sure check on it. I know General. I meet with General Cartwright quite frequently, and I'll talk to him about it and check with him. The other issue, and that's what to what you were referring, Mr. Young, and I do appreciate. I think we're going to be able to talk about this on the floor. It's a significant one, and I thank you once again for your staff for the willingness to work on this. Going back once again to the missile defense issue, that uh, that we sometimes make some cavalier decisions that deal with the industrial base and recognizing the industrial base is not a spigot you can turn on and off and that if you make decisions that would require the industrial base to be shut down for a year and then the next year allegedly rehire them back, that's not a, that's not a wise approach to it. I think we call it kind of a smart closeout or a smart warm line and that's the issue to which we'll be talking about. I think in the authorization bill we have traditionally had uh, 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 intent language uh, uh, what's the term? Program language? In the report language. Uh, yeah. See, I'm getting old here. I can't remember all these words. To, no, that's what, you, that's what you did. This is simply report no, language. No, we don't do here, Marcia. Unfortunately. To, uh, report the, language. The original earmark may come up here soon if you keep this up. But yeah, report language that was coming there to once again remind the, the administration that what you need to do is maintain a smart warm line production in that, that uh, we, we, do, we may indeed have an eight-year gap between 2022 and 2030 in our Minuteman 3 system and a new system. But what is specifically important is to realize if once 2012 and the, and, the, and the program has not been adopted and you pick up the new program starting in 2013, there is a problem in that transition. They have done it in the past, but apparently the military likes to be instructed as to how to do it, and that is clearly within the purview of what Congress does, is to instruct the military on how the money should be spent. So it's an issue, I realize it, we've talked about it, I think we'll talk about it on the floor. I just want you to know, Mr. Young, I appreciate you and your staff working with me on that. Uh, Mr. Dix, I'm sure you're aware of this as well, and I appreciate uh, being able to go through this one as well, and we'll probably talk about it again. One, one thing I, I wanna just say to the gentleman, um, protecting our industrial base especially as we're downsizing somewhat, is going to be a real challenge. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we did on this bill was to protect our tank base, which the idea of cutting, shutting it down for three years and then reopening it would have cost us million, billions. And, that, and the chairman was, wanted to make sure that did not happen, and I completely concurred with him. Um, so we, we are very sensitive about industrial base. We worry about the, you know, the airplane you know, we have one un airplane under construction now, the Joint Strike Fighter. And, uh, I mean, for the foreseeable future, that is, that's, a, that's a big question mark in my mind. Uh, you know, the F-18s are coming to the end, F the C-17s are coming to an end. Uh, we're going to have a bomber at some point, but that's, you know, one airplane. Well, I, since you brought it up, <clears throat> the F-35 is an essential aircraft. And it is the future of our Air Force. And yeah, it is a Navy big pot of money. For all, yes, I didn't get that far yet. But yeah, it's for all three of those branches. And it is, it is the future. It is significant. It makes a difference. Uh, the ability to control the skies is something we have had since the Korean War. And we sometimes take that for granted. So I recognize the problem you have in there, and I appreciate your moving forward on that particular issue at the same time. As I said, you got lots of moving parts in this. This is a big issue. All of these are important because this is the core constitutional program uh, that we have, which is to provide for the common defense. And I appreciate your work. I appreciate your staff. We'll be talking to you about these particular issues again. I appreciate your kindness in helping me deal with these. Thank you, sir. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I could just make a quick response. Also, Mr. Bishop makes a very good point. In fact, uh, immediately upon assuming the chairmanship of the subcommittee again this year, I met with the Secretary of Defense and told him that we were going to be very strict on stopping a program, starting a program, stopping a program, starting a program, because it gets very, very expensive. And it is very inefficient way to maintain the industrial base. 
And Mr. Dix mentioned the tank issue. We had quite a, uh, quite a discussion with the Pentagon, with the Army specifically, uh, about this. And we de decided not to, not to shut down the, the three-year shutdown. But on H.R. 1, uh, the party wasn't real evident to many of the members, but there were a number of cases where we were being faced with a very large terminating cost of several programs. The committee worked really hard with the Pentagon, with the contractors, to work out solutions where we could take the money that would have been paid to terminate a program and get something for it, like continued research and development or additional, additional versions of what it was that the contract was supposed to buy. So we're very much aware of this, and we think that we will be able to save a lot of money if we can stop this business of just terminating a program without giving any thought to what it costs to terminate them. Uh, thank you for that. And it's, it's a wise approach. I appreciate both of you. Appreciate your staff. I'll yield back now. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Young and Mr. Dix. Thank you for your um, continued work and the collegiality. And um, I know how hard the staff works, and I appreciate it very much. And Mr. Dix, I appreciated your words about Afghanistan uh, because I am the one who has been very concerned about our deepening involvement in that country and the cost in terms of uh, not only treasure but in terms of blood. And um, and I don't even know, I can't even get anyone to tell me what, what we're doing there anymore. Um, uh, but I have to, uh, one thing that concerns me is, as you, as you were speaking, I'm just looking at a, a Washington Post story that just um, is appearing online that the president is going to announce uh, 10,000 troops out this year and another 20,000 up by the by the end of next year. That's, uh, and the White House is spinning this as a, as a substantial drawdown. I don't believe that's a substantial drawdown. Uh, you know, they're, they're saying that they're going to change, that they, they're looking more at counterterrorism versus counterinsurgency to, to, to leave 90,000 troops uh, or by the end of next year, uh, 70,000 American troops in country um, to me is unacceptable. It, it basically is kicking the can down the road till after the election. And then we'll decide what to do about this about this policy. But I, you know, I I was hoping that the White House um, would have announced would have, would be announcing something more substantial, uh, including a change in our policy. But it appears that what they're doing is just um, continuing the same old same old, uh, and then we'll deal with this uh, at the end of next year. I I just think that that's wrong, and um, I, I I would. Yes, and suspect that there will be vigorous debate on the uh, on the appropriations bill in reaction to what the president uh, is going to announce tonight. But uh, I, I have to tell you, I, as somebody uh, who is who has long believed that we need to rethink our policy in Afghanistan, I, I am I'm disappointed by what appears to be the announcement. Maybe maybe the stories are wrong. Maybe he'll surprise us and do something more substantial. But I mean, I think the American people want. A, a, fundamental change in our policy. I think we almost passed an amendment here in Congress that would have demanded the President to come up with an exit strategy. Um, you know, I, and and we're, in, we're in a war that appears to have no end. No one can define what we're doing there anymore. As you mentioned, Al-Qaeda is gone. They're in other parts of the world. And we got Osama bin Laden, not with 100,000 troops, but with a highly trained uh, group of Navy SEALs. And we got them in Pakistan, not even in Afghanistan. So, um, you know, I. I, a lot of the money for these wars, uh, well, the money's for these wars, a big, big chunk of it is in, in, in this bill. Uh, but uh, I, I, don't, I don't see how this ends based on what the White House is going to announce today. So I just say that to you because I think you can expect that there will be a lot of people who will, who will want to be heard on this issue. But I appreciate your, your comments in particular. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, we'll have uh, 30,000 more unemployed people then when they come back because we're incapable of uh, hiring people uh, with as new employees. They'll and, still be in the military. Sir. Oh, they might well still well, not be. All we'll of save them. a lot of money, won't we? Not, not all of them. The 53rd Enhanced Combat Brigade just was demobilized. So, and these were National Guard troops. Yeah. Uh, they do not have jobs. We're frantically working to find jobs for them. And our, our governor in Florida is working, because a lot of these are Floridians, they're working really hard to find jobs because they're, they're basically civilians, but they were part of a combat operation for five years. 
demobilized, they're out of a job. They're not still in the military. But prolonging the war in Afghanistan is not a jobs okay. program. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, and I appreciate that. And uh, I'm sorry that uh, we have not effectively uh, had people understand that the reason why we're in Afghanistan is to protect this country. We're in Afghanistan because it's in America's best interest to uh, go about and kill people before they kill innocent Americans uh, and fly planes into our buildings and bomb America. And so I am sorry. I know both of you are very strong supporters of not only the military, uh, but the uh, desire to keep America strong and free. And uh, I will tell you that I believe that the reason why uh, Mr. Bin Laden was caught was because of an extensive uh, and very long effort uh, to rid uh, the world of those who are very evil and backwards and mean people who would uh, not only kill women and take advantage of them and take away women's rights, uh, but who would uh, harm America. And so on behalf of at least myself, I would say thank you to both of you who have taken your time to be very diligent about understanding the needs of not just men and women who protect this country and their families, but more importantly of the mission that is necessary to ensure uh, that uh, the Al-Qaeda network, uh, identification of these people, uh, and, uh, and their mission is something that we would stay attuned to. So I want to thank you on behalf of myself. I'll speak for myself, but, but tell you that uh, this is still a very dangerous world. It's a dangerous world for anyone. Um, who would choose to speak of freedom and opportunity. And so, my friends, great job, and I appreciate all that you've done. I yield back. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, Chairman uh, uh, Young and uh, Ranking Member Dix, I, I thank you all, and I fully recognize that um, uh, the measure before us has more to do uh, uh, than just um, uh, Afghanistan, but like my colleague, Mr. M uh, McGovern, I really do find it very troubling uh, that resources are being devoted further um, in that engagement, and I, I disagree with my uh, uh, friend uh, from Texas, uh, uh, Mr. Session. I don't think our uh, mission in Afghanistan um, was correctly described by him. Um, my understanding, uh, by all accounts, was originally when we went there, it was for the purpose of uh, trying to assure um, uh, that we would catch and uh, kill or um, uh, do whatever we could uh, with Osama bin Laden. The mission converted somewhere along the way uh, to ridding Afghanistan of the Taliban. And now we are negotiating with the Taliban. And uh, we also have um, uh, 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 no uh, chance of this democracy uh, in that place where empires go to die. Um, uh, everybody in here knows that we fought on uh, the side of um, uh, persons in Afghanistan um, against um, uh, uh, Russia, who had to leave there. Everybody, even Genghis Khan has had to leave that place. And, we find ourselves there. What bothers me is this. Aside from the young men coming home, as you point out, Chairman Young, um, that shouldn't exist when people serve in the National Guard and or the Reserve and go into um, uh, combat areas. They should not be put in the position of being without uh, employment when they return. But of course, this nation is topsy-turvy um, and when it comes to employment. And the simple fact of the matter is, through no fault of either of yours, but through the fault of continuing administration, we have continued to be about the business of uh, involvement in activities in a variety of places around the world without paying for it. Now, both of you are old enough, as am I, to know that we paid for the Second World War, or we paid for Vietnam, whether we liked it or not, we paid for North Korea, 
uh, but Iraq and Afghanistan and now Libya are on the tab somewhere. And therein lies a part of the problem as to why the nation, uh, in my judgment, is in the trouble that it is in because we have expended monies in places where in the final analysis we haven't protected safety one bit. I predict for everybody here that when we leave Iraq someday in the future, when we leave there, Iraq will be owned by Iran. And now that just change simply doesn't make sense. 5,000 deaths later, millions of dollars, billions even, walking off just like in Pakistan. We have people sitting there that the embassy to get paid and then uh, don't have any accountability for it. All of us, I sat on the Intelligence Committee, we have $12 billion that walk off that nobody knows where it went. And I, for one, uh, just find that anathema. I'm for a strong nation. I'm for a nation being able to defend itself. I'm also uh, for peace to peace. And we find ourselves on the opposite side of that contract. But this is wrong, not your fault. Not even your colleagues that you work with, but the overall structure of how we go about our living. We find ourselves now not able to take care of homeless people that need medical care. We have cut in programs for men, women, and children that are sick and we are, 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 are cannot take care of a crisis when they come up. I shudder to think what would happen if we brought all of them home uh, from all over the world. We wouldn't have a job for them, and we're not doing the same for Syrian folks. All we're doing, y'all get the point. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In view of uh, my friend from Florida's comments, this, this conversation has taken place at all levels in the Congress, believe me, Republican, Democrat, conservative, liberal, uh, and all over the country. So we, and we understand that, uh, but we don't, we don't deal with that in this bill. One thing you did mention, we deal with this in, in this bill, and that's Libya. There is no money in this bill for Libya. The administration did not ask for any. Uh, we, we consistently asked the president to give us an idea what he thought it would cost, how long it would take, what the, what the ground rules were going to be, et cetera, et cetera, no answers. Uh, finally, the controller of the, of the Defense Department did finally respond, and here's what he told us how they're going to pay for Libya, which is now approaching, getting close to $800 million. We're using fourth quarter FY11 money, fourth quarter money that the troops are going to need in the last quarter of this year. Uh, they are not going to ask for a supplemental, according to the De Defense Department. Uh, they will try to resolve this issue by manipulating funds within the overall accounts through what they, we refer to as the reprogramming uh, process. Uh, so that's the answer. No money for Libya. The only money in this bill that's even related to Libya is $48 million that we included to replenish our supply of munitions that, that were used early on to suppress uh, Gaddafi's uh, air defense capabilities. Right. My good friend uh, may have misunderstood what I said. I did not uh, suggest uh, uh, to you, Chairman, that there was money in this bill for Libya. What I said was that we didn't pay for Iraq and we didn't pay for Afghanistan and we're not paying for Libya. I'm not talking about in this particular measure, but since you brought it up, I suggest uh, that there's one good way that we could get our money back if we were to get work with the Transnational Council and use some of the $30 billion that is frozen here in Libya. We could have done the same thing somehow or another in Iraq. When I tried to do it, the parliamentarian told me that I couldn't cause a country where we spent billions of dollars to pay back reconstruction money to our country, and they have either the third or fourth largest or oil field yeah. in the world. Yeah. Somehow or another, that just does not compute. When I need a water treatment plant in Belglade and I see one blown up in Iraq that we paid for, something is wrong with the picture. Well, I would say to the gentleman, I did not misunderstand what he said. I just took advantage of him opening the subject to, to say something that I forgot to say in my opening comments, <laughs> and that is, that is, there's no money in this bill for Libya. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, it's exactly that kind of candor that uh, makes me uh, happy I'm on the Rules Committee. I have no questions for these gentlemen. Thank you. Call us. Uh, 
uh, since that was brought up about Libya, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to ask one question. If we were to adopt this, and if we were to have another resolution, 1973, by the United Nations, and if it, w it dealt with Syria and the civilians there or in uh, Bahrain or in Jordan or in some other place, it dealt with civilians and, and the mission was the same and it was an Odyssey Dawn mission number two, could, they, could the administration manipulate the money here to do those operations? And would we be back in the same position we are with Libya in basically saying we hold the purse strings and yet it is what we it is and we're there and we have to operate within that parameter. Could that happen in those countries with this budget? Oh, that, that's, a, that's a tough question because it could happen. Uh, the administration could basically do what they did with Libya. Uh, there, there are those of us who believe that they have basically ignored the War Powers Act anyway. Uh, and they're not asking for any money, so Congress was basically kept out of the issue. Uh, tomorrow, uh, the House will have an opportunity to debate uh, one or two, maybe three, different resolutions relative uh, to Libya and to that type of uh, involvement based strictly on a presidential decision. Uh, what the votes will be, I don't know. I know how I'm going to vote, but I don't know what the, what the final vote will be. But... Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, it could happen. But I would also, I'll just throw in a little plug here, Mr. Chairman. When the War Powers Act was passed in 1973, as sort of an upstart young member of Congress, I thought that it leaned too heavy toward the president. It gave the president much more authority than it gave the Congress. And the Congress and the Constitution pretty much decides about going to war and pretty much decides about how to fund it. And so uh, this upstart younger member of Congress wrote a substitute. And I offered that substitute on the floor and I thought I had a brilliant debate and defense of my uh, substitute. But I only got 166 votes for it. That was all the Republicans that were in the House in 1973. That was leaned more towards a balanced relationship of the executive branch and the legislative branch, which is what anything dealing with war, with killing, should be, a joint effort between the administration and between the Congress, not one over the other. And so the way things have been happening, uh, I say to my colleague from Florida, uh, the answer is yes, things like that could happen again. Uh, we, we're hoping to find a way to try to avoid that. If, could I comment? Uh, sure. on, on this issue, uh, the administration, uh, I think, will be very cautious about further involvement. And the reason I say that is this was a unique circumstance. You guy had the United Nations uh, Security Council taking a vote and uh, saying that we were going to do protect these people from a humanitarian basis, you had the Arab League asking for uh, our in involvement, and um, and NATO, the countries of France and England were you know, very strongly committed to this. I think that was a unique situation that might you know we we've had other situations: Grenada, Panama, um, the Reagan bombed. Uh, Libya himself, um, he, he didn't think much of Gaddafi, by the way. Um, so this was, a, I think, a unique situation. And I, I think the you know, administration is going to be very cautious about other involvements. That's just my, my perception. And I hope he's right. Gentlemen, uh, thank you very much. Um, if you only had 166 Republicans in 1973, I wonder what that number dropped to after the 74 election, which uh, it was, uh, you had to be down in the dumpster. We had then, two, yeah. I can tell you in 76, we had 295 Democrats. Yeah, you had a hell of a lot more uh, Democrats than we have Republicans right now. Gentlemen, thanks very much for uh, your great work, and uh, we look forward to uh, beginning consideration of this measure um, this week. So with that, the... Um,
hearing portion for consideration of uh, the appropriations uh, rule uh, comes to an end. And let me, let me say that uh, we are in the midst of uh, discussions on the Libya rule, and we are not, for those members who were not here, we were not, we were not, uh, are not going to consider the Libya rule today. Uh, it's likely, it's possible that we will consider it tomorrow on the floor. And what I'd like to do is proceed with uh, consideration of the, the rule for the DOD appropriations bill, and then we are going to uh, uh, do the activity report and then uh, organize our subcommittees. So the chair of, uh, excuse us, thank you for being here. It's wonderful to see you. Chair will be in receipt of a motion. Mr. Chairman, that was my, uh, that was my fan club. Is this your motion? <laughs> was my fan club who, uh, those are the strongest supporters you have. We best know supporters that. I've got. Yeah, 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 yeah. Best I can Chair, say. Chair, I'm receipt of a motion from the gentleman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, from Dallas, Texas. Mr. Chairman, I move the committee grant H.R. 2219, the Department of Defense Appropriations Act 2012, an open rule. Will provides one hour general debate, equally divided and controlled by the chairman and ranking member, minority member of the Committee on Appropriations. Rule waives all points of order against consideration of the bill. Rule waives points of order against provisions in the bill for failure to comply with Clause 2 of Rule 21. Rule provides that the bill shall be considered for amendment under the five-minute rule. The rule authorizes the chair to accord priority and recognition to members who have pre-printed their amendments in the congressional records. Rule provides one motion to recommit with or without instructions. Section 2 of the rule establishes a standing order of the House which prohibits consideration of an amendment to a general appropriations bill proposed proposing both a decrease in an appropriation designated at the cost of the global war on terror pursuant to Section 301 of the House Concurrent Resolution 34 and an increase in the appropriation not so designated or vice versa. You've uh, heard the motion of the gentleman. Any discuss your amendment? If not, the vote occurs on the gentleman's motion. Those in favor will say aye. Those opposed, aye. no. And share the ayes have it. The ayes on the open rule. The ayes have it. The motion is agreed to. And uh, this will be managed by Mr. Nugent will be managing this rule for the majority. Mr. Hastings. And Mr. Hastings for the, uh, for the minority. Now we will proceed with uh, the consideration of um, the activity report. So do you have that motion? I do, Chairman. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Dallas for a motion related to con constituting the majority uh, Okay, are we doing the subcommittee's recognition for a motion on the activity report? Mr. Chair, Chair recognizes the gentleman from Dallas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, pursuant to Clause 1D of Rule 11, I move the committee report to the House its semi-annual report on the activities of the committee for the first quarter of the 112th Congress. Any uh, discussion? Uh, Mr. Chairman, yes, yeah. we are not yet ready. I'm not going to go back a little more time. Uh, sure. Absolutely. We will anxiously look forward to it. We'll, we'll wait with bated breath for your report. Thank you for that. And uh, the uh, vote on the, there's a vote on the motion. Those in favor will say aye. Those opposed, aye. Make sure the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The uh, motion is agreed to. Chair now recognizes the uh, gentleman from Dallas for a motion relating to the constituting the majority caucus for the Thank subcommittees you. of the Committee on Rules. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move that the majority caucus of the subcommittees of the Committee on Rules be constituted as follows. Subcommittee on Legislation and Budget Process, Mr. Sessions Chairman, Ms. Fox, Mr. Woodall, Mr. Webster, and Mr. Dreyer. Subcommittee on the Rules and Organization of the House, Mr. Nugent Chair, Mr. Bishop, Mr. Scott, and Mr. Ch Mr. Dreyer. The uh, question occurs on the uh, motion by the gentleman. Those in favor will say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. Pay the chair the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The motion is agreed to. And now chair recognizes the gentlewoman from New York for a motion relating to constituting the minority caucus of the subcommittee on Committee on the Rules. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move the minority caucus of subcommittees of the Committee on Rules be constituted as follows. The subcommittee on rules and organization of the House, Mr. McGovern, as ranking member, and myself. The subcommittee of legislative and budget process, Mr. Hastings, as ranking member, and Mr. Polis. Question occurs on the motion of the gentlewoman from New York. Those in favor will say aye. Those opposed, no. Opinion the chair, the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The motion is agreed to. And my one directive is to all of these great subcommittees, Mr. Sessions and Mr. Nugent, as leaders of this uh, effort, I hope you all can uh, get to work. So uh, no recorded vote. So you didn't have to do anything to justify your existence here, Hugh. So 
Uh, we will let you all know uh, at what time we're going to meet, possibly tomorrow, on the uh, Libya uh, resolution. So without objection, the committee stands adjourned. Thank you all very much.